new union is growing, a European Union. But what should Britain's relationship with it be? And what is Britain's place in the world post World War II? Well, some believed that Britain should have maintained a free trade policy, trading freely with the whole world as it had done in the past. While others believed that Britain would be much safer and more prosperous within a European wide protectionist trade bloc. It's the 1960s and Britain's economy is failing. Meanwhile, relationships with the Commonwealth and the Free Trade Association are shrinking. Therefore, the Conservative Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan, with advice from his advisor, Edward Heath, decided that joining the common market would be the best plan to improve Britain's economic issues. But the French said none. In 1967, the Labour Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, also tried to join the common market. Harold Wilson didn't like the political idea of a new world, but simply thought that it would be beneficial to Britain economically. However, opposition to this plan was high. The Labour Party at this point had a long tradition of being opposed to joining the common market. But Harold Wilson attempted to join anyway, at risk of splitting the Labour Party. But the French, once again, said none. These events led to the creation of the Anti-Common Market and Free Trade Party. They were also known as the Free Trade Liberal Party, the All-Party Anti-Common Market, and the Democratic Conservative Party. It was a single-issue, right-wing, libertarian party, meaning that they believed in free trade and small government. They saw no political opposition into the UK joining, and therefore created this party to gain a stage to offer the opposition arguments against joining the common market, with winning elections as a secondary matter. It was very much a temporary party to attempt to steer the conversation, as they saw that the main three political parties in Britain were all in favour of joining. There are three main spearheads of this party. The first and economic backbone of the party was Arthur Sheldon. He was the co-president of the Institute of Economic Affairs, with interests in neoliberalism and classical liberalism. He was a strong believer in free trade, and his economic reforms in the 1970s would help steer Britain into beating its economic crisis. And he's still a much cited economist to this day. God, and uh, I began to sense a sort of anti-working class sentiment in all political parties. They wanted the state to do these things, and yeah. they didn't like people to do things for themselves. They taught that that only people weren't capable. That's they right. forgot all the history of what the working classes. The records are that, that the working classes were sending their children to school by the 1860s. Yeah. They were insured for for, for, for health uh, for health cover and so on by by, by 1910, when uh, all parties, Tory and um, Liberal, uh, so called passed the, the famous or infamous act of, of 1911, which forced the working classes to ensure with, with the state. The second was Christopher Ferrer Smith, who was the on the grounds political activist of the party. He was vital in leading the Keep Britain Out of the Common Market campaign. He feared a United States of Europe and believed that the UK should be a free and independent nation. He performed many publicity stunts to make the British people aware of the attempts to join the common market, as he believed that there wasn't enough media attention surrounding this big issue. His most famous stunt was when he led a procession of mourners behind a coffin, and within the coffin was British democracy, as he felt that if we joined the common market, we would be killing off British democracy. He strongly supported a referendum to ask the British people whether or not we should join, and he and his supporters fought with French police a couple times as they refused him entry to debates. And the third was Oliver Smedley, who acted as a sort of figurehead of the party and also funded many of the campaigns. He served in Iraq, North Korea, Sicily and Italy in the Royal Artillery during World War II and was noted for bravery in the Battle of Normandy. He also later became a paratrooper and participated in Operation Market Garden. He later became a businessman with ties to pirate radio, bars and nightclubs. He described himself as an uncompromising free trader and libertarian. He helped to fund the Farmers and Smallholders Association and the Institute of Economic Affairs. He had links to the Liberal and Conservative parties and took over the Free Trade League and the Golden Club. 
He was a member of the Liberal Party until he left, when the rest of the party was in favour of joining the European Economic Community. He then went on to fund the Keep Britain Out campaign, as he also felt that none of the elected parties were providing suitable opposition. ...that it does not deteriorate into a group of states surrounded by high tariff walls, then uh, that is the right spirit to go in if we go in at all. The campaign against joining the common market started in 1966. We'll only be looking at the elections of Oliver and Christopher, but the party did contest many seats with similar results. Christopher stuck his neck out first and contested the seat of Melbourne. However, he only got 445 votes, or 1.45% of the vote. Oliver did slightly better the following year. In Walthamstow West, he got 3% of the vote, with 542 votes. It's possible here that he split some of the Labour voters to his side and caused Labour to lose the election. Christopher tried again in 1972, but this time in Sutton and Chem. He did significantly better, gaining 4% of the vote, with 1,332 votes. This is a really good turnout for a small party, getting around half of the vote of the Labour Party. It's also notable here that he beat the National Independence Party, who were also worried about joining the common market, as they were worried about immigration and communism. It's now 1970 and the Conservative Edward Heath has just beaten Labour and become the new Prime Minister. He was an avid globalist and fought and was distinctioned in World War II. He wanted a united Europe to stop any other wars that he'd fought through. He was also in favour of a federal European state, with the UK as one of many states. He had tried to get the UK to join the single market before, but the French said none. But Britain was no longer an empire and Edward Heath was determined that a unified Europe was our new future. There was now also a new president of France, so Edward went to France and asked them, and this time they said we. Oui. And so, in 1973, Edward Heath took the whole of the United Kingdom into the single market. There was no public referendum. By 1974, Edward Heath had lost control of the economy once more. And this led to Labour's Harold Wilson regaining the Premiership. Harold stated that Britain had joined the common market on unfavourable terms that no other nation would have signed up for. There was also discontent in Britain, especially on the Labour side, of us not having a referendum on joining the common market. To stop the Labour Party from splitting, Harold Wilson was forced to give the public a referendum in 1975. However, now Labour was much more split than before, with the unions gave him much more favour and influence within the common market. Therefore, Harold Wilson remained quiet during the referendum, while Edward Heath campaigned passionately to remain. The opposition would now fall on the shoulders of the anti-common market campaign. We'll now be going over the main points of those in favour and those against Britain joining the common market, starting with the arguments of those in favour of joining the common market. After a numerous amount of wars, Joining a union together will stop the constant fighting and death. British industry will thrive within the common market, as many Europeans are desperate to buy British goods, and the UK production will increase when we join the common market, as there will be more demand. Britain is just a small island all on our own, and without the Europeans, we'll sink into obscurity. The common market will help finance British industry and help us trade further abroad. British business will move to high growth economies within the common market if we fail to join. Britain paying more into the common market than it gets out will only be in the short term. But people have frightened us. The anti-marketeers have frightened us with, the, with, with ideas about the size of this entrance fee. If you add it all up in a realistic fashion, what you're going to have to sacrifice is the probable growth of our exports in one year, the amount of increase in our exports in one good year will have to go into this entrance fee. From then on, we're on our own, and I take it that we're going to grow faster, and if we grow even moderately faster, we shall be many, many hundreds of millions of pounds richer at the end of five to ten years. In the long term, other economies will be paying an equal amount to Britain. The nations within the common market are growing quicker than the UK, and therefore if the UK joins, our economy will also grow quicker. 
Labour unions will have much more power and influence when they merge with European unions, and this will give British workers more rights and pay. When we join, the price of goods will go down, as the UK will be able to import cheaper common market goods. The common market is not only a market, but also a club, and the members of the club will bail each other out when things go wrong, protecting failing British business. Joining the common market will over time offer greater educational options to UK students and workers. The faceless bureaucrats in Brussels will have little to no say over British people's everyday lives. Very little will change on a local level and British people will still feel British. I feel a Dutchman now and uh, just the same as 20 years before when common market started. I, I can't see any uh, difference now in those 20 years between me my being a Dutchman. National independence is out of date. All nations are coming together in big blocks and failure to join a big block will result in the UK losing say of what happens in the world. There is no doubt Europe is not playing a real part in economic but much more in political affairs in the world. It has a choice to, de to remain divided and to play no real part or to unite and to play a real part that means to be a partner to the free world and not a satellite of one or the other big powers. So I believe it's the, it's the fate of most of the European countries which still have officially a sovereignty but very often and in the size of question can't make use of it. The UK will remain fully sovereign. Every law will be made in the House of Commons and there's no chance of a European army. The common market is not a federal bloc. When foreign nations want to invest in Europe, they will ask the common market where the best place to invest is. If the UK is not part of the common market, the UK will fail to gain this investment. The UK can't keep going as we are. If we join the common market now, we can turn the tide, improve peace in the world and grow the UK economy. Now we'll be exploring the arguments against joining the common market and for free trade. The UK should trade with the whole world equally, without looking inward or favouring only those close by. The UK should maintain our strong trade ties with nations like New Zealand and the rest of the Commonwealth. If we join the common market, Britain will lose our special trade terms and instead have to trade on the same terms as Europe. It will cost the UK a lot of money to enter the common market and the UK will have to pay much more in the common market than we get out, supporting only the smaller common market nations. The price of goods will go up, as the UK will no longer be able to negotiate our own trade deals and be lumped with only European goods. For example, the cheap clothing and food from African and South American nations will no longer be able to be traded in the UK freely. Furthermore, the prices of food and clothing within the common market are more than double the price. We should not be able to make commercial treaty. There would not be a Britain commercially. It wouldn't exist that nations that wanted to sign trade treaties with us, for example, would not be able to do so. They would have to make their treaties with the six. The UK does not need to join the common market for greater trade routes, as we already have more trade routes and relationships with other nations around the world than the whole of Europe combined. The problems of the UK economy are down to mismanagement on the part of the UK government, socialism and communist strikes. They can be solved without joining the common market, and joining the common market will not resolve them. The effect of joining the common market to British industry will be negligible. Joining the common market will not save British industry, because our problems are that our industries are uncompetitive and there are ongoing union strikes. The UK will slowly lose our self of national identity. We will no longer consider ourselves British, but many will consider themselves Europeans. This will result in losing much of our culture and heritage and everything that comes with being British, ruining social cohesion. Building a new European political bloc will escalate the Cold War and the Russians will be more likely to invade Eastern European nations, not less likely. Much of the UK produce export to the Commonwealth, not into the common market. If we join the common market, the UK agricultural industry will shrink significantly. Independent farmers will suffer and local food prices will increase. British food farmers will not be able to compete with French and Spanish fruit farmers. Therefore, this will shrink the British fruit industry. This is because the French and Spanish governments subsidise their fruit industry, but the British government doesn't. 
I have many grower friends in Holland and Germany, and since they've been in the common market, they have been completely ruined, and they have not been able to compete against subsidized competition from France. And I feel that horticulture is being used as one of the giveaway things in order to get us into the common market. Hill farming and sheep herding will also be uncompetitive, impacting Welsh and Scottish economies dreadfully. If the UK joins the common market, many fishing communities across the UK will lose their fishing rights and competitiveness. The UK will be forced to revoke our fishery protections, resulting in overfishing in British waters by European fishermen, which will over time ruin our underwater wildlife. European nations are well known for fishing out their stocks instead of conserving them. One of the curious things about this fishing question is that just before we started serious negotiations to join the common market, the six countries of the common market decided on their fishing policy, which they knew would be totally unacceptable to us. Why did they do it? Because they have fished out their own shores and they want the fish from this country. British fish will migrate to Iceland and Greenland once the Europeans have ruined our waters. This will result in the UK having to import fish from Greenland and Iceland, which will increase the cost of fish and chips. This will reduce the competitiveness of fish and chips, leading to other foreign takeaways outselling them. The UK will lose our sovereignty, as not all of our laws will be made in the House of Commons. This will only get worse over time, as the common market forms into a federal bloc. As this federal system grows, it will remove democracy further away from British people. If you talk about political unity, it must mean a merging of sovereignty, and therefore a loss of sovereignty, by the parliaments and the nations which merge. The British Parliament decides British agricultural policy. The instant we are in the common market, British agricultural policy, which is of some little importance, is not going to be decided by the Parliament at Westminster. Of course it isn't. It's going to be decided somewhere else. Britain has and always will think differently to the rest of the Europeans. And therefore we will be constantly outvoted in the European Parliament and may as well not even vote. The British people are being rushed into this. Joining the common market is an historic decision and we need much more time to debate. For we are not just a part of Europe, at least not yet. We have a different history, we have ties and links which run across the whole world. If this is the idea, the end of Britain as an independent nation state, I make no apology for repeating it, the end of a thousand years of history. You may say, all right, let it end. But my goodness, it's a decision that needs a little care and thought. The question on the ballot in 1975 was as follows. Do you think the United Kingdom should stay in the European community, the common market? And 67.2% of the country said yes. The Conservative and Liberal Party were both in favour, and the Labour Party were split. England was most in favour of remaining within the common market. 69% of the country said yes, with 14,918,009 votes in favour of remaining. The UK as a whole was second, with 67% of people voting yes, with 17,378,581 yes votes. Wales was the third most willing, with 65% of the country voting yes, with 869,135 yes votes. Fourth was Scotland, with 58% of the people voting yes, with 1,332,186 yes votes. And finally, Northern Ireland was the most apprehensive. 52% of the country voted yes, with 259,251 yes votes. Less than half of the Northern Ireland population even bothered to vote. And 65% of the UK population as a whole voted. This was 10% less than the last general election, showing that the British people thought that general elections were much more important. Oliver didn't give up the fight right away. He came last place in the Saffron Weldon 1977 election with 1,818 votes, or 4.47% of the vote. And this election is much more important, the 1979 East Southern election. Here you can see the party shrinking significantly, with less than 1% of the vote, with only around 207 votes. Instead taking third place was the New Britain Party. 
This was a further right-wing party than the anti-common market party. They were also against joining the common market, but this time their campaign focused more on immigration lines. This shows the swing of people becoming more concerned about immigration in the UK. This is important as many new immigrants made their way into the United Kingdom after we joined the common market and the anti-common market party would later dissolve. Labour's Howard Wilson was publicly disappointed by the vote, but behind closed doors, he was secretly happy with the result. Christopher Newman Friere Smith later added, It is our belief, now that the campaign is over, that our partners will proceed full steam ahead towards a political union. However, the free traders, now known as Eurosceptics, never stopped the fight. They claimed over time, as things started to go wrong, that the pros of being tied to Europe were showing themselves as false, and that the UK would thrive perfectly fine outside of Europe, and that those claiming otherwise are just fear-mongering. Therefore, now what do they say? What is the message that comes now? No longer to tell the British people about the goodies that lie there. No longer that. That won't wash, will it? Because the evidence will no longer support it. And so the message, the message that comes out is fear, fear, fear. Fear because you won't have any food. Fear of unemployment. Fear that we've somehow been so reduced as a country that we can no longer, as it were, totter about in the world, independent as a nation. And a constant attrition of our morale, a constant attempt to tell us that what we have, and what we have is not only our own achievement, but what generations of Englishmen have helped us to achieve, is not worth a damn. The kind of laughter that greeted the early references that I made that what was involved was the transfer of the whole of our democratic system to others. Not a damn. Well, I tell you, what we now have to face in Britain, what the whole argument is about, now that the fraud and the promise has been exposed, what it's about is basically the morale and the self-confidence of our people. We can shape our future. We are 55 million people. Thanks for watching the video. Check out this playlist here for more information about other defunct UK parties and the references used in this video are in the description. Have a good day.